Hello and welcome to another episode of Mental Architecture, Building the Mind One Moment at a Time. I'm Howard Blumenfeld and this um, web series is based off of my book by the same name and you can find that on Amazon exclusively on a discount. So I'd like to talk today about uh, Chapter 3, Section 2, which is the challenge of infinity. Trying to think about the finite is pretty easy to do. Finite things are things that can be counted and we can visualize a certain number of them. But thinking about something that is endless, that is unbounded, that has no end to it, is very difficult. Because the moment that you picture it ending, it's not infinite anymore. For something to be infinite, it has to just keep going on and on and on forever. Many ancient civilizations wrestled with the concept of unboundedness, and it wasn't until the 17th century that that idea really had a robust symbol, and that symbol was coined by John Wallace, and it looks kind of like a sideways eight if you look at it. It's just something that keeps going around and around and around and never ends, and so that symbol is known as infinity. And it's important to understand that infinity is not a number, but it's just a symbol to represent the idea of unboundedness. And it wasn't until the 18th century that the concept of infinity really became mathematically rigorous. And that was done by a mathematician by the name of George Cantor, uh, who's also credited for uh, developing the Cantor set. And he took the elements of set theory to extrapolate that infinity has a lot more to it than initially meets the eye. And so I want to share the following quote with you from uh, Alastair Wilkins about infinity. Cantor provided a stunning and instantly controversial proof that not only defined the nature of infinity, but it also revealed that multiple infinities existed, and some were larger than others. What made this achievement all the more remarkable was that he has built the entire thing out of an old and seemingly useless branch of mathematics known as set theory. So Cantor developed infinity out of ideas from set theory, and one of the most basic ideas in set theory, and I'm not going to bog you down with a lot of mathematical details, so don't worry if you don't like math too much, but is the idea of cardinality. So what cardinality is, is it is a way of counting the number of elements inside of a set. And the easiest way you could think of this is think of a set as like a container and maybe marbles inside of that set as elements. So if I had a container with 10 elements in it, I would say that the cardinality of that set is 10. Now I promised you that I wouldn't get too much into detail, so I'm gonna keep that promise. But one thing I will tell you is that the smallest infinite set according to Cantor, has a cardinality or size of Aleph Knot. Aleph is a, is a letter from the Hebrew Aleph Bet. Um, the knot is the zero at the bottom. So based on that size, you can actually develop larger infinite sets. To illustrate how bizarre cardinality gets with the infinite, let's look at a pretty simple example. So let's think about the set that contains the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, all forever. And then another set that contains all even integers like two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, and so on. So it turns out that even though you would expect the size of the first set to be bigger than the second set, because it has, in your mind, more numbers, more elements, it turns out that the two sets have exactly the same size or cardinality. That's really kind of weird. But there's something even weirder than that called the Cantor set. So to understand how the Cantor set works, let's take a look at this diagram. If you look at the top, you'll see a, lo a very long black bar. And what we're gonna do is we'll just say the size of that black bar is a certain amount, Aleph nut. And then we're going to take that bar and we're gonna cut out the middle third. And so if you go one line down, you'll see two bars now that are equal in length. And then we're gonna do the same thing to each of those two bars and then the same thing to the resulting bars below it and below it and below it and just keep going like this forever. And so the most counterintuitive thing about these bars is that these bars represent sets of an infinite set of numbers, let's say, um, each of these bars, like zero to one for the top bar and um, zero to one third, one third to two thirds for the second bar and then so on and so forth. The size of the little tiny bars at the very bottom, and they'd be tinier if we kept going and going, is actually the same as the size of the big bar. And that is an absolute, um, con absolutely confusing, and one of the most counterintuitive things about infinite sets. 
So this only works if we assume these sets are infinite um, and not uh, finite, okay? So that is just something that's bizarre. So it's like take all the numbers between zero and one and these would be all the real numbers, so all the square roots and fractions, all their kinds of things in there. We split that in half and then we get, or we don't split it in half, but we take out the middle third and we get two thirds, one on either side that also have an infinite number amount of, of numbers in there numbers from zero to one third and numbers from uh, two thirds to one. And then we split those and split those and all this whole time, each one of those sets has the same size, something that is just extremely counterintuitive, but has been proven to be true through rigorous mathematics. While trying to understand the infinite has driven a lot of people to insanity, quite literally, there are some fun paradoxes that you can play around with. And one of them is from Zeno of Alexandria, an ancient philosopher who came up with Zeno's paradoxes. And one of the paradoxes is called the dichotomy paradox. And it basically works where you have to travel an interval of length one, could be like, you know, one meter. But first you have to step over half a meter. You have to, before you do that, you have to step over half of that meter and then half of that meter and half of that meter and half of that meter and so on. So you would basically, to have to travel the entire distance, you have to travel all of those little sub distances which there are infinitely many of, so the conclusion is that motion is impossible. The reason why motion would be impossible is because in order to traverse that distance, there would be all these little position markers that you would first have to step on. It wouldn't be hard to step on the one that's maybe half a meter out or a fourth a meter or an eighth a meter, but when you start getting smaller and smaller, it becomes really hard to even visualize where those position markers would be. And this is a problem with the nature of the infinite, is the practicality of it. What being do you know of that's small enough that could traverse all those infinitesimally small distances? There really aren't any. So this is one of the issues. We have this idea of infinity that mathematically is robust and sound and based off of the foundations of set theory, but then in practice trying to identify infinite things or infinite processes is a lot more difficult. So we know that infinity exists in mathematics, but the bigger question is, does infinity exist in the real world around you? And one guy by the name of Steve Patterson doesn't believe that it does. He thinks that all things infinite are just imaginary and that would not really exist in reality. And he makes a pretty compelling argument for it. I'd like to share the following quote with you. Try to imagine a circle with infinite radius. The radius isn't really big, it's actually infinite. Is this possible? I am certain you cannot imagine such a thing. It's the same reason you cannot imagine a square circle. The concept is incoherent. So I want you to consider a circle. It looks like this. The radius of the circle would be the distance from the center of the circle to any point along the circle. Now, if we start to make the radius larger and larger and larger, we just get a bigger and bigger circle. But what would happen if we were to just have a circle that was had an infinitely long radius, what would that even look like? You just see the circle growing and growing and growing and growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a very strange thing indeed, but you could never actually have a circle with an infinite radius because that would contradict it being a circle at all because a circle is basically bounded by the circumference or the perimeter of the circle. So the problem with an infinite object is that it's both an enclosed object but at the same time still growing and that just makes no sense at all. The very idea of the infinite makes it so that it can't be enclosed by anything just like the infinite circle which is always a, a circle no matter how large the radius gets but as it goes bigger and bigger it's still a circle at all times. Now that doesn't mean that the concept of infinity is useless. It's an idea of what happens as you approach things getting really large, which has innumerable applications in science and engineering. But it does bring up a question of the utility of the infinite. We just have to be careful about how we talk about infinity and always remember that infinity is not a number. It's, it's more of a destination that you approach but never get to. A little bit confusing so but in the world around us it sure doesn't seem like anything infinite exists and i mean at least on earth there are not there's not infinitely many of anything 
everything is finite here on this planet and it makes you kind of wonder about the rest of the universe. And that's exactly what my next video will talk about. So our brains commit a certain kind of logical fallacy whenever we imagine the infinite or endless because when we imagine something, we can't imagine it never ending. We can imagine it continually expanding, but even at every moment in its expansion, it's still finite. It's the finite nature of it doesn't change. So it's more correct to think of the infinite as a, a process of approaching something, which is exactly the way that we think about it in mathematics. So thank you very much for joining me for another Mental Architecture video. I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Please remember to like, subscribe, and comment below. And I just want to say thank you, and I hope everybody has a great day.